Edwards and John Willis um, from DTO Solutions talking about uh, operations as a strategic weapon. A um, couple of things going on. Uh, we've got microphones at the front um, on both sides for questions. So at, at the end of the talk, there'll be a little bit of time for questioning, hopefully. Um, if you want to just make your way to, the, to one of the microphones, then everyone can hear you a bit easier. Um, the other thing is that the pass, uh, well, the actual cards that you're name on open out. And in there is a lot of information, including there's an iPhone app with the whole schedule on. Um, so if you're not sure what's on, um, and, or you can't go onto the Wi-Fi, hopefully you can download the app and um, find out what's going on. Um, with that, over to you guys. Thanks. Can everybody hear me? Can you hear me in the back okay? Great. How's it going? So uh, yeah, so uh, you know, you guys probably come to this conference for a bit of uh, career development, right? And you're going to get plenty of uh, plenty of that over the next couple of days. But um, John and I, this is John Willis, by the way, everybody. So uh, we're here to talk about um, a part of uh, career development that often gets uh, gets skipped over, right? And that's the relationship between business and IT. I mean, unless we do this as a hobby, we have to. Uh, we're here for uh, you know to help a company make money, and that's how we all. We all get paid, and see by the very nature of you being here, I know we're part of a self-selecting crowd, right? I mean, we understand, uh, you know, what the future holds. We understand all the things that Luke was talking about and uh, the importance of uh, of IT operations. Uh, but what about the rest of the world, right? How do you explain the value of what we do to uh, to them, right? If you're in the trenches, how do you relate the value uh, to the business and get the projects that you want to get funded? How do you get them funded? Um, if you're a manager, you know, how do you evaluate your operations, and you know, how do you build a business case for further investment in in your IT? Uh, Operations. So John and I are actually going to do this in two parts. I'm going to kind of give uh, one piece of it and talk about the business proposition, and then John's going to come back out and uh, dig in a little bit uh, deeper, like he, uh, you guys who know him well, always, uh, always does. So uh, I had a couple of aha moments I want to start with, kind of recently. Uh, has everybody seen this before? Uh, raise your hand if you've seen this. Uh, you've seen this before, right? It's uh, from okay, good. So it's from uh, John Alspa and Paul Hammond's very seminal talk in 2009. Uh, uh, Velocity Conference. It was uh, trying to describe the cultural differences between developers and operations, and I think you guys could probably figure out which one is uh, which one is which, right? And and it's good for it's good for a laugh, haha. We all have fun. It's a stereotype, but we know you know it's a little bit derogatory. But at the end of the day, we all know that you know our lives or our jobs are, are much more than that. So we just kind of go on with uh, with it and after a good laugh. In fact, the DevOps days in Mountain View, we actually made this the T-shirt, and everybody had a great. Uh, had a great time. And I was actually wearing this t-shirt when I had another realization. So uh, I'm part of a company called DTO Solutions. And uh, we do uh, process improvement and uh, automated infrastructure for all kinds of companies, but mostly those who build and operate some sort of revenue producing software based service, right? Sort of fancy way of saying e-commerce, gaming, financial services. And uh, you know, recently we started to say, hey, as, you know, we've got a company here. We should probably start asking ourselves about kind of our clients and the work we do for them. And um, one thing in particular, we started to figure out, well, when did our clients call us, right? Um, this is kind of one of the questions we asked ourselves. And so we decided this is all very back the napkin kind of stuff. But we said, you know, let's put them in three buckets, right? There's the, uh, there's the first sign of an issue brewing. Like someone knows, eh, you know, we could probably do better at this. Um, second bucket was there's some initial negative impact felt by somebody, like, wow, this is a problem, but the rest of the organization doesn't really see it yet, but I want to kind of get a jump on it. And the third bucket is help my head's on fire, right? And um, as you can probably guess, surprisingly, not unsurprisingly, um, somewhere around 65% of our clients were at the our head is on fire stage uh, before they actually called us for some some help. So we're like, well, you know, why why is that, right? And so we did a little digging and started asking people, hey, what's, you know, what's, uh, you know, why did you wait so long? Number one answer, couldn't get the budget approval or business support, right? Which, in business speak, that's translation for, you know, either you or the problem that you're telling me about isn't worth spending the money, right? Until it finally becomes such a bad problem, heads on fire, um, it basically becomes get some help or uh, we're in serious uh, trouble. So, Kind of came the realization that you know ops really does have a perception problem. Excuse me, the business really does have a perception problem with operations, right? Um, you know, kind of the classic business view is you know operations is this necessary cost or dare I say necessary evil, right? Or just something you gotta some bill you gotta pay to keep the uh, to keep the lights on. Whereas you know we understand that this is actually some some, some uh, strategic, right? We're the keepers of this factory that runs the uh, the digital business, right? So you might be saying, well, okay, so you know. The business folks don't appreciate us, so what, right? What else is, uh, what else is new? Well, you know, the reason why to care is, I mean, obviously, as we said before, this isn't your, uh, your hobby, this is, this is your, uh, your work. But also, you know, consider that larger portions of these budgets are being, of companies' budgets are being spent on, um, on their IT. And especially for any jobs, any companies that most people in this room will work for, 
um, you know, it could be the, the bulk of, of, of the, uh, the budget for the company. And, you know, first law of business spending, right? Things that cost you money, spend less. Things that make you money, spend more, right? Um, and, you know, the things that, uh, make no mistake about it, somebody is, you know, spending money on you, and they're going to look at you and say, do I cut this, do I outsource this, or do I spend more on it, right? So, in order to do that, we have to change the business's perspective on operations, and what's it, uh, what's it for? We've got to move them from this idea that it's some necessary cost that we have to incur to this is a strategic uh, uh, competency that we need to, uh, to invest in, right? And how are you going to do that? Well, we've got to do it in their language. We've got to make the argument from their point of view. Throwing terms like DevOps or cloud or infrastructure as code at them is not going to persuade any arguments, right? So let's start with kind of the textbook MBA definition of what operations is, right? Um, of course, there was quite a few different definitions. <laughs> so I went with this guy, uh, David Upton. He's the chair of operations management at Oxford University. I figure he knows better than anybody, right? And he says, operations is all the activities that a firm conducts in order to deliver value to its customers. It's a set of processes that transforms either materials or information into a product or a service, right? That sounds pretty important, sounds necessary, but is it necessarily strategic? Is it something that can tell the business that if we are better at this, we will beat our, um, our competition? So if we kind of look at this in a diagram form, right, according to the definition, operations, which is the title we assign ourselves, right, is the function that supports the entire value creation chain, right? Um, and for, if you're an information-based business, that value creation chain is your core business process, right? It's about getting an idea from, you know, the aha moment to where there's some sort of measurable result in a customer-facing environment that's hopefully making you guys money. Now, we know there's all kinds of processes that happen across that value chain. Let's just kind of skip over that for, uh, for now and think about it as one, as one thing. So we hope that business process resonates with the customer, right? It's going to make us some money. That's all, of our, that's all of our hope. Of course, that's sort of the, uh, kind of the blind faith that we all have in the, in the startup world especially. But more often than not, it goes the other way, right? So now there's an important thing called your cycle time, right? And that's how long does it take to get an idea from where it's in the business guy's head to where it's in that customer-facing environment and making you, and making you money. Uh, now, you know, that cycle doesn't happen just once. It's usually a continuing process, right? And when you measure that over time, that's what you consider your, your velocity of innovation. How fast can you get these ideas from the business to the customer, the results back to the business, make an adjustment, and move, uh, and move back forward, right? So you might say, well, you know, why does this really matter, right? And you know, once upon a time, you know, companies were able to you know, achieve a somewhat defensible position based on technology, right? You can just build the better technology and you will, uh, and you will win. But you know, then came the web, right? And the web it basically screwed up everything, right? Now your customers are coming to you over a standard tool, right? Like a you know, browser, or, excuse me, a standard interface, like a browser or a mobile app over a standard uh, a published protocol, right? So your competition is only a few keystrokes away. You really can't differentiate yourself. So how do we compete these days, right? There's really kind of three ways. One is scale, right? Scale data, scale of users, sort of the Google, Facebook. If you build a big enough critical mass, you can stay ahead of your, uh, of your customers. Um, all the social network effects play into that, right? Um, and the second way you can, we can compete is we can innovate quicker, right? I can just keep outpacing the, uh, the competition. And the third way is to lower costs. I can offer my service at a lower cost. So, uh, let's scratch the first one off the list, uh, not because it's not important, but it's probably the most straightforward problem to, uh, to solve, right? Um, you know, it's, it's a known problem. There's lots of known solutions out there to borrow from. You hire smart architects. You let them follow their best practices. You throw a big pile of cash at them, and hopefully uh, the problem will get solved. Now, that's obviously an oversimplification. I don't want to ruffle anyone's uh, feathers if you consider yourself a scaling expert, but there's plenty of prior art out there, and it kind of treads on the architecture side. So. Uh, we're just going to kind of ignore that for now and focus on the, uh, the bottom two, right? Innovate quicker and uh, lowering costs. So looking at the further, further on the innovation quicker, um, you know, one thing people, uh, you know, they fail to realize or they should realize that innovation is really a numbers game, right? So uh, there's these guys, the Doblin um, Innovation Consultants. They're considered some of the best in the world at helping companies increase their um, the, the quality of their, of their innovation. And uh, they've done a bunch of surveys and figured out that of all the... Um, the innovation success rate across all industries and uh, all geographies basically comes down to, the success, success, the success rate comes down to about 4%, right? So that means 94% of all attempts to innovate end up in some sort of, some sort of failure, some kind of reset. We got to try something, uh, something again. So it really is a numbers game. So how do you win in a numbers game, right? Um, you know, so basically if you look at it this way, you have to increase the number of chances that you get at hitting that prize, right? Think of like a carnival game. I've got 10 balls, you've got one ball, who has a better chance of, of, uh, 
of winning, obviously it's going to be the person that can take more shots in that same, in that same period of time. Um, you know, this is also a reason why burn rate is something that's, that's often a misleading, uh, a misleading uh, number, right? Um, who cares if I have six months of cash left in the bank or a year left of cash in the bank? If I can only get one, two, three shots out, but my customers can get 30, my, excuse me, my competitors can get 30, 40 shots, um, chances are that they're going to uh, beat me to the, uh, to the punch. So not sure people saw this, but um, this was uh, actually from John Jenkins uh, from Amazon gave a talk at Velocities last year, and it kind of threw some things out there that sort of slid under the radar, but it popped up on Hacker News a couple weeks ago. Um, some interesting numbers of you know, how fast Amazon can really move, right? I mean, they look at themselves as they innovate their operation, they innovate in how they run their, uh, their operations. And uh, you know, they're doing a production deployment every 11.6 seconds during the week. That's actually a, a push to a production server. Um, their record so far is 1,079, this is as of the summer, 1,079 deployments in any one hour. But the most startling fact is that 0.001% of all deployments actually cause some sort of um, outage or impact on, on customer activity. Um, you know, Amazon takes it as operations is their strategic weapon, right? Their books aren't better, their hypervisors aren't better, um, you know, their storage units aren't any better than someone else's, someone else's storage unit. Right? Um, but you know, what they're able to do is they're able to keep rolling out new features and lowering costs faster than their competitors can do, really do either one. Right? So some of you say, well, all right, well, but you know, is the business already thinking about this? I mean, if I can give them faster, if I can give them a capability to move faster, will they really take advantage of it? I think there's another movement that we should all keep an eye on, and that's the, uh, uh, the lean startup movement. Right? And it's kind of basically been sort of, uh, it really came from the startup community, obviously, by the name. But we're now starting to see it permeate through enterprises as well, saying, look, you know, there's this, this model of validated learning uh, that basically describes you know, how fast a business should move. And they're doing, a lot of, they're doing a great job of promoting case studies, starting to infiltrate various MBA programs, and you will see the business starting to talk about these models. And obviously, um, you know, operations, without the right technical operation as, as the underpinnings, these models can't, can't, uh, can't exist, right? So, um, we talked about innovating quicker. You know, how else can we, uh, you know, can we compete? It's lowering costs, right? Now, um, John's going to talk about this in more detail, so I'm going I'm to leave it up to, uh, to him. But uh, you know, it, the argument is not about reducing cost, right? That's an argument that usually ends up in an outsourcing debate, and that's not where you want to go. You want to focus on your return on investment, right? How can we get better at doing more with the same amount of money, right? Um, that way you're actually incentivizing the business to give you more money because you will do increasingly uh, more with it, a better return on their, on their investment in you. So again, I don't want to step on John, so I'll stop that. So sum it all up, right? You know, save, again, save the buzzwords like DevOps, cloud, infrastructures, code, that stuff, right? We we'll, can use that amongst friends here and people know what we're talking about. Um, but you know, what you want to do is go home and walk down the hall and talk to your business folks about giving them you know, two things. How can we increase the velocity of innovation and improve the, the return on investment. If you start talking to them in that language, they will suddenly take notice in what, in what you're doing, and you will find a champion who will support uh, what, you, what, you want to, uh, what you want to accomplish. Also another tip, throw a word in there like continuously, that's usually a buzzword for an ongoing initiative versus a project that's got a, a start and a finish, a little helps with the, uh, with the budget. So um, let's talk. Uh, you know, if you guys find yourself needing to make a business case or you have a war story you want to share, you know, please get in touch. Um, I think you know, if we all get better at this, um, this can help everyone in, in this room. Um, you know, so rising tide helps, uh, helps all boats. And um, on that note, I'm going to let John uh, do his part do. And then we'll take questions. Thank you, Damon. Um, i got to apologize. Damon told me this was a chef conference. So I was just not prepared for this. So why I ought to. No, um, all right. So all kidding aside, you are an ass. All kidding aside, right? So how many people in this room consider themselves an ass? Not that many. Surely a couple of you guys are asses. But um, all right, so that's good. Well, there's a guy, there's a guy that started this company called GreenWidgets.com. And uh, the thing was, he had like really freaking great widgets. You know, They were really shiny green, awesome. They were the lowest price widgets. You can give them to kids. They, can, they couldn't destroy them. The perfect stuff. But the thing was. They realized they really, you know, no matter how good they were, and, and you know, you hear Damon talking about, you know, Amazon. Like, it's not, it's not that they sell better books, or you know, in some cases, sell it cheaper. It's 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 something that I'll ask you that. What does Amazon and Netflix get? Sure. What does Amazon and Netflix get that 
um, Barnes and Noble and uh, Blockbuster. Anybody? Bueller. No? Somebody last time I did this said money. Yeah, that's, <laughs> but uh, slide. Yeah, they, they get what that S means, right? And that's the whole point of this presentation. And, and partially what we're trying to do is, is, I think most of the people are in this echo chamber here, but if you're not, God bless you. Um, and that is that, you know, our argument would be that DevOps is probably the best way today to deal with the S in a world where probably everybody should be an ass. And if you're not an ass, you're probably going to go out of business or you're in some weird business that doesn't matter. So to start this kind of why um, DevOps is like the right strategy for this, and I'm not even going to go into what DevOps is and all. At the end, I'll talk a little bit. Is, um, it, I, I tell this a technical debt story. Right? And one of the things we do at DTO is, you know, most people know and understand like when you analyze software technical debt, right, and all that. We actually concentrate on kind of operational infrastructure technical debt, right? That DevOps thing, right? So we actually look at your operational infrastructure and try to figure out and calculate what is the technical debt and how it's killing you. So so back to the widgets. How many people know who these guys are? Yeah, a couple of you, right? They're the guys that invented Facebook, right? So, um, so anyway, so the thing was, that wasn't their first venture. When they were little snot-nosed brat kids, they actually wanted to start a widget company. And the thing was, they couldn't decide. They were battling, like, the, the guy on the right, I think, is Cameron, and the other guy is Tyler, right? And, and they, they couldn't decide which, um, whether they were going to make green widgets or red widgets. And they battled and battled. And they went to their dad, you know, and their dad, Daddy, we need a million dollars each. We want to start this widget company. And Daddy's like, uh, you know, wait a minute. You know, I, I know you're spoiled rotten kids, but you know, give me some, something that I can use. How much are you going to make? And they're like, Daddy, guarantee that you'll make, we'll make 10 million each. Businessman that he is, he says, huh, OK, that's $10 million with a million dollar investment, 10 minus 1. That's 9 divided by 1. Oh, that's a 900 return on investment. I like that. I'll do that. And in truth, to be serious for a minute, that's a, you go to any, any project in a business, and if they're looking at it, and you get the right questions and the right strategy and how you're going to build this, right? That's a winning, if you can prove that that's what you're going to do. But the truth of the matter is, next slide, is that old Tyler was wrong. Tyler actually only got a 233% return on investment or rate of return. Right? Because what happened was he miscalculated technical debt. Right, he actually incurred not more than just a million. It cost him another two million. And the simple math is 10 minus 3 is 7 divided by 3, which is 233. And good old Cameron, he worked out OK. And Daddy was pretty happy with him, right? So, but the thing is, it's got worse for old uh, Tyler. Um, next slide. So Tyler was stuck in his technical debt. But there's a gentleman called Israel Gatt, who's an, the Agile executive. And he talks about, in fact, Damon did a great video with him on our DevOps Cafe podcast. And he talks about the vicious cycle of technical debt. Right? And the vicious cycle of technical debt is the things that you didn't do up front that actually you wind up doing more and more, the fixing the things you didn't fix, that the things that you fix in a hurry that now become more fixed. And you wind up pulling resources off from the things that you really wanted to do. And the next thing you know, you're in this kind of vicious cycle where you're actually giving less resources to what your customers really need and more resources into the things that you need to fix. I always joke, you know, you know, when I go around and I sell infrastructure as code, I say, as people, are you running a business or are you building a business? You know, where are you spending your time, right? So this vicious cycle. And then there's this thing that I came up with, big deal, called toxic operations. Right? And that's the point where your operations is actually stakes. I mean, it's like you don't want to go swimming in that pool. Right? And, and, um, and, and so there's a great story about Ameri um, Ameritrade and E-Trade. Right, and E-Trade had found out that Ameritrade, what they were charging, Ameritrade, what Ameritrade was charging their customers per transaction was less than what E-Trade's internal cost was to process a transaction. Right, that's toxic operation. That's when like, oh my God, you know, shit, sorry, I said it, starts falling all over the place, right? And then actually, you know, I, I, I've been, we've been working with this company right now where they're actually in toxic operations. And, I, and there's, um, there's the guy who brought us in. There's the CEO. We're in a triangle. With this, the CTO wants to shut down this line of business. They're in a new line of business, but this has been their core business. Everybody agrees it's a toxic operation scenario. 
Um, the question is, the CEO and the guy who brought us in don't believe that it's terminal. And the CTO does. And now what we've been doing for the last couple of weeks, in fact, I'm flying out to China Saturday to go to see their other half of their really toxic side of the business, is to prove to them, and we don't know. I mean, well, honestly, when we first came into the assessment, I don't know if the answer is, you know, punt. And, uh, and you know, so the, you know, the question is, is back to the slide Damon said I was going to talk about, right, which is Jesse Robbins, my ex-boss who runs Velocity. He does something else. Like, I can't remember what, other, what else he does, but he's got some other job. But anyway, he, um, he did this in 2006, and it was called The Tale of Two Startups. And it was, uh, you know, it was really cool. I mean, I dug this out like a year. I'm like, Jesse, why don't we use this? You know, it's marketing material. This is awesome, right? And so what he did is, I think he totally made up the numbers, but I don't care. I don't <laughs> give a shit, right? So, but the thing is that what he did is he said, because um, it works, right? It's like Gartner, right? I, I, let me go on a side, right? Gartner, we know anybody from Gartner room, do we? <laughs> Good. Um, like, like Gartner sucks, but except when you got to use one of your charts to prove something to somebody, right? <laughs> All right. So, um, so anyway, that's one of these cases, right? So the, uh, he, what he wanted to say is that basically over a 12-week period, two startups were going to get to 20 servers and the choices they made to get there. And the legacy, and I use this now, I call it the DevOps versus the non-DevOps. So the non-DevOps is the amount of hours they put in the first two weeks. And that kind of dip there is probably start, you know, the, the first customer-facing release, right? But if you notice, look at the amount of time that they put into things like config, OS install, hardware, and more specifically, if you look what I would call the DevOps scenario, look how much time they put up front in what I think we all would say and love is infrastructure as code, right? And, and if you watch the numbers, like, it, it become, like, it's, it's obvious where their cost is. And just because I actually wanted a reason to play with R, I did some forecasting on this for the full year. And I'm telling you, I won't publish it to anybody because it's horrible looking. And I totally probably got it all wrong. But again, here again, going back to the Gartner thing, I'm going to use it. Right? So, and that is that my numbers came up with it that the guy on the right got about an 800% return on investment. And these guys got about 140% return on investment. And more importantly, this is a number everybody can deal with, is the number I came up with, the guys on the left, was one sysadmin to about 50 servers. And the one I came up with the guys on the right was one sysadmin to about 3,000 servers. Right, next slide. So Alistair Kroll, another big, I'm a big fan of, right? He runs um, Cloud Connect, and he's Interop, he does all the cloud Interop, he's BitNorth, he's an uh, uh, O'Reilly Radar guy as well. So he's recently read this article, Meet to Math Ratio, right? Everybody's heard of the Meet Cloud, right? The Meet Cloud, right? So he wrote a Meet to Math Ratio. And this is when I gotta look at my notes because I, I don't have that great of a memory anymore as I get older. But um, so, he, so he, what he did is he took the ratio of revenue to employee, again, just like server ratio to sysadmin, not a great number to figure out like whether you're doing it or right. It has some holes in it. But if you take Amazon versus Barnes & Noble, he took um, a Q4 2010, Amazon had about $13 billion in revenue with about 35,000 employees. Barnes & Noble for the same quarter had about $2 billion with the same amount of employees. Right? And, and then he took Netflix, which was about a half a billion in revenue for Q409 with 1,000 employees versus Blockbuster with about a half a million in revenue with 60,000 employees. Right? That means something. And I think you all know basically part of why you're here, what, it, part, of it, what, it, what part of it means. And then look at old Dropbox, right? Dropbox like 25 million in revenue with uh, 70 employees. That's steroid shit. And I'll tell you what. I, I know the guys from Dropbox, right? Like, they're using infrastructure as code. They're using legacy. They're not using HP. They're not using Tivoli, right? And neither are those guys, right? They're doing it what I would call the DevOps way. All right, so um, moving on. So I got into a fight. Well, we call them debates on Twitter, right? But um, you don't really fight people, even though you really would like to. So I, I wrote this thing. And most of this, this might offend you as much as it offended this gentleman. But I put out, I was replying to somebody else said, DevOps is more of a people issue than a technology issue. Puppet slash chef. See, so he didn't hear me yell. Won't fix your dysfunctional relationships. And then um, he came back and said, oh, yeah, no, I agree. Puppet chef won't fix your different But I disagree. They make your sysadmins more in production. I'm like, OK, let's try this again. Uh, respectfully. For whom? The sysadmins or the business? The point is org first. You saw uh, Damon's chart, process and tools. 
And again, he agreed with me without di with, a, with disagreeing with me. Of course, and provisioning machines faster, more securely, helps bottom line, even if DevOps relationship remains dysfunctional. No, sorry. You're wrong again, pal. Next slide. Because I'm going to tell you about clouds gone wild. It's a cloud gone wrong story. A poor cloud that basically they had this idea for a game, an online game. And they figured out there were women that before Oprah and after Oprah would just chew this game apart, right? Just become avid. They never watch it during Oprah, but before and after, we're going to kill it, right? So they, they wrote some Flash, PHE, My, MySQL, Memcache, put the thing together, phenomenally successful. Just blew it out the door. So successful that they actually started creating new businesses. And they cloned one. And then the clone, clone, the clone. You ever see that movie Multiplicity, right? You know, the clone of the clone of the clone. And uh, it was all good. And then some guy came in, and I'm kind of making things up a little bit, but some, most of it's true. Some guy comes in, hold the force. We got four games now. And they're, I know how to do this. First thing you do is you put Puppet in. Huh? Oh, yeah, hey, she sounds like he knows what he's doing. Let's, let's put Puppet in, right? And this is that guy's argument, right? But guess what? The freaking ship had already launched, right? The, the, it left the dock, right? Because guess what? Some of the games put Puppet in, some of them didn't. You ever, listen, how, mostly people use Puppet, right? Of course, no, yeah. Oh, come on, how many people use Puppet? Yeah, there you go, all right, good. Um, so here's the thing, right? You ever have a situation where you type something in on a config file, phone rings, you talk, you go back, and that thing, what you did is gone. And the first thing you do, if, you, if you're like me, you say, it was probably those drugs when I was in college. So. <laughs> so I'll go ahead and do it again. And then this time I get the phone call and I go back, and now wait a minute, I know I did a lot of drugs in college, but there's no freaking way, I did this this time. And then about, you know, if you're really stupid like me, about the third time you're like, God damn it, it was puppet. <laughs> right? Well, imagine that at scale with 40 games, with guys who like use Puppet and don't use Puppet, and some guys do and some guys don't. And um, next slide, please. The, when we went in there, so I tell you what we do. We come in and we help people assess their process. We do value stream mapping. We go through. It's really a lot of fun. Um, in fact, I left Ops Code. I was actually VP of Services Ops Code for about a year and a half, right? And it was a great place. I love those guys. I love that product. I love this space. But I love what we do now 10 times more. Because I get to sit through the whole process with really freaking smart people. And on both sides, right? And, and so we went in and we did this. This is before I actually came there. And they sat down with this big gaming company and we mapped out their process and it was insanity. It was some people use YUM, some people do RPM packages, some people dump scripts in S3, some people, um, the, the last, like whenever you build a server, they use right scale, right? Because they were supposed to. That was the thing Damon always reminds me. The story about this is they did everything right. They were told use the cloud. They were told use right scale. They were told use Puppet. Right? But they, they created, in fact, the, the, the real joke was when they first got started, it took 15 minutes to provision a server. When we got there at 40 games, it took two weeks to provision a server. Right? It got worse. So I couldn't tell this guy in, in a 140 character tweet what I'm telling you guys. Right? It, the tools don't, I mean, tools are great. I'm a big believer of this space. Right, I love this crap, but um, next slide. Okay, a little debt. Good, thank you. So, next slide. Good old technical debt. So here's the thing that, kind of epiphany when I got to Detail, and I got it from um, uh, Damon and, and Alex Honor started Detail, and, and Alex, um, Damon's not that smart, but the, Alex is really smart. Um, very smart, thank you. Um, so, but you know, he, we, we talked about this idea, and I, I kind of came up with this idea of infrastructure development lifecycle, or ID, IDLC, right? So we all kind of bought into infrastructure as code, right? But the thing I realized about that gaming company was it wasn't just infrastructure as code. It was the factory. The IT is the factory. And there's only one way to go in. There's only one door to get in. It's the same way software gets in, right? What does it do? It starts in source control. It goes to some continuous integration, some build process, some unit testing, some functional testing, right? It has a, a node uh, source of authority, maybe right scale, might be Puffet, it might be Chef. But that, that company didn't have one. That was the other part of that story. It's like, you know, some products had to build their own list that once a day they, they copied and scraped from somewhere else, right? And, but the, the true, uh, I think that when, you know, Luke's uh, presentation, which was awesome, by the way, um, I, know, I know you guys know that, but, um, the, the thing was that, that like where that top of the mountain where he had, 
I think it looks like this. It's not just fully automated, it's, it's the life cycle. It's fully automated infrastructure development life cycle where it doesn't matter what's going to hit the factory, it's a piece of software, it's a config file, it's an install, it's whatever. Nobody gets past the system. Right? Next slide. So quickly meet your competition. What do we got in time? Oh, we're doing pretty good. We're doing great. So we've got some uh, case studies. Is Jay Lineman in the room? Jay, there he is. So he did a report last year for 451 Group about, you know, about four or five DevOps. Really, really good story, right? It covered a couple of the companies. And um, Wealthfront was one of the companies. And there was Shopzilla and Sonian and National Instruments, which were all great case studies for, um, I kept begging them at the time, like, like, can you not do, like, can you find some more chef? Because almost all of them were puppet users, you know? I'm like, you know, geez, can we just put at least one chef customer in there? But Wealthfront is a puppet customer. And Wealthfront is amazing. So Wealthfront to me is the poster child for DevOps. So let me tell you a little about them. So first off, I'll talk about like, what, what like Etsy and Wealthfront and Flickr, they, 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 they kind of make the badge of honor is that they say our developers on the first day push to production. And they do that before they even fill out their insurance forms. Wow, that's pretty cool. What Wealthfront does is the guy who, on the interview process, pushed the production. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. That's how bulletproof their infrastructure is. Right? Their infrastructure actually is, from check-in to production delivery, happens in under three minutes. They have, at the time we talked to them, we did some videos with them, 6,000 unit tests. They've got um, a self-healing um, deployment management system that does blue light, green light deploys, where they, before they, they destage a node out of the cluster, they go through all this kind of cucumber, nagios, um, selenium, all sorts of testing. If it passes, then they pull the next one out of the node. All that in under three minutes. They've actually put, and talking about technical debt, like not having technical debt, they actually spent a fair amount of engineering time on how to do unit tests with minimized I.O. Like they spent engineering time, you know, I mean, that's a hard argument, right? But which, you know, you know who do you want to be? And I'll, I guess I'll save that question in the end, right? And so a couple more slides. So on the wealth front, uh, and Damon talked about, we're big believers on this kind of lineage of DevOps. You know, Stephen Blank, who wrote Four Steps to Epiphany, customer-driven developer, custom methodology development. Um, and then Eric uh, Reese, Lean Startup, who was actually a student of, Stephen Blank, he did his first kind of, well, his famous startup was IMVU. He wrote a blog about all of his experiences, implementing all that. And a lot of the companies like Etsy, Wealthfront actually, Eric Reese was on their board, right? He actually mentored them through that process. So I think this is a, there's other uh, threads in the DevOps lineage, but this is definitely a strong one. Um, and so just quickly, you know, and when they tell their story, they talk about how, you know, they start out kind of a one to four weeks, and this was the process, and then they get, they're down to, in, in, you know, this is five to ten here, but they've, on video, and when our discussions with them, talked about three-minute deploys, right? You know, uh, eliminating stage, cutting a release, basically automating that whole process. Not, you, know, you know, people will talk about, well, like Luke said it earlier, like, you know, does Puppet allow me to fire people? No, 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 no. Does, like, automated, like, provisioning, continuous integration, continuous delivery let me fire people? No, 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 no. It just makes you freaking more production. In fact, Damon talked about the Amazon, the, the, that Amazon video. You must watch that Amazon video. Homework assignment, right? Everybody tonight, you don't go drinking beer, you watch this video, right? Um, so all that's the first part of the video, first third of the video is a great explanation if you need to explain to somebody in the organization why you should go to cloud. Now, if you don't want to do that, skip to the second third. Right? Second third is he talks about these phenomenal things that they do that Damon talked about, 11.6 deploys per second, um, you know, just crazy, crazy stuff, right? Um, but one of the things that blew me away during that presentation, he talks about how they do their deployments. And so, like, I talked about how Wealthfront, and most people will use, who are advanced will use that kind of green, blue light deploy, you pull a node out of a cluster, kind of put it in stage, but dynamically stage, push back. Well, he talks about in that presentation how that's still a complex process. Because when you get to like the 15th node in a 20 node cluster and it fails and you got to do a rollback, at a minimum somebody's going to be on call. Chances of it working every time, going all the way back and no customer disruption, in his words, not likely. So 
what they've done is they actually, when they start to deploy, they basically forklift the current cluster into another Amazon. By the way, they eat their own dog food, they use Amazon. Although he actually mentioned that it wasn't until November 2010 that they finally shut off their last non-EC2. Uh, and he said it was the first time they ever publicly announced that. that, that they, so they, the whole myth about they, they got into EC2 to solve their, re, their seasonal capacity issue, that's bull, bullshit, right? Um, it is. Um, but, um, but the thing was, that um, what they did is they actually forklift the cluster, then go through the process. If everything works, they switch the load balancer. Talk about a reason for the cloud. And then they shows the statistics of the, you know, the error rates and you know, that number that Damon showed, right? Insane, right? So next slide. So Wealthfront. So Etsy, yeah, one next one. Etsy, right? This is another great company to watch. There's two things I love about Etsy is um, like everything about oh, John Ospar, right? Rock star. star. So, I do, pres this is going to be video streamed. I'm sorry, John, I'll do it again. Um, you are a rock star. Sorry, he hates that. But, um, but the thing is, is that when I try to convince people that technical debt, that left-hand side, and Dame was saying to people like, yeah, you know, we get it. Oh, I understand what you're saying, but we got to have this thing out next week. You know, we got to get this thing out by October. You know, I, I do, I get it. Technical debt, we should use infrastructure as code. We should do all this. We should all do all that. But management is just crushing us to get this thing out in the beginning of October. Like, no, that's all wrong. And a company right now, they say they're building the biggest public cloud in the history of mankind. And I think they're right. And we went, we spent a lot of time with them on a DevOps, all the technical, the, everything they need to know. And the first, the first argument we had is squabbling with them that they can get $80 an hour sysadmins, and why would they pay us the money they pay? Man, you totally missed that whole point of what we're talking about. But that, that wasn't even that. It was, it was that, like, we don't have time for that. You know, we get it, but we don't have time for that. No, you're building the biggest, you're going to look like that other cloud that we just showed you, right? So, but what these guys get, go back, I'm sorry, go back to the other thing, is, um, is the culture thing. The culture in numbers. And I, what I was saying is that you, the first thing, you, the whole point I was talking about Rockstar with John Ospar is that, like, if I want to convince somebody that they're doing a greenfield project in a startup, they, they always, it's easy for them to get the Rockstar architect. Right? Nobody balks at that. But then when you try to tell them to go get the equivalent level ops guy, they're like scratch their head and like, yeah, I can get guys in, you know, in Asia to do that for 40 bucks an hour. Why would I do that? Like, you're totally missing the point. You need those, they need to be peers. I got another client right now where I'm begging, I'm helping them choose the resume of the guy who's going to, I've had interviews with the architect, and he's a great architect, but he doesn't know what he doesn't know. And the thing I'm trying to convince these guys is to find a guy like that so that he can sit at the table at a peer level and say, you're wrong. You're right about that, you're right about that, but you're wrong about that. Right? And the other thing about, so they get the culture, they're also number crunchers, so you can go out there to their website, the engineering site, and just see what they do at numbers. Uh, moving on. So the question that I will ask all of you, and you're probably already, or the question I ask potential clients He's like, all right, I give you, I've given you my speech. You can either think I'm full of crap or not, right? I don't give a rip. But when I'm talking to a potential client, I'm like, you know, which class do you want to be in? Because guess what, folks? What most of us know in this room, we're the five percenters. I think, I think um, Luke said we're one percenters, right, uh, in his presentation, right? We're the five percenters. And so I asked these people, who are the 95 percenters, is, would you like to take this gift from me? And I know I'm very condescending, I'm an asshole, but would you like to be in the 95 percentile? Here, I'm handing you this, like, get out of jail free card, dude. And, and then they scratched their head, and, and, I, and I just, and to be honest with you, business is pretty freaking good right now. So I don't give you a whole lot of time to wait. I'm like, next. Call me in six months. And they typically do. Right, so... So like we said, uh, we're at DevOps. We do DevOps Cafe. So if you, if you think I'm a jerk, don't go there. If you, want, if you think I like, made any sense, I try to do three or four drop, what I call droplets, 10 minute DevOps drops. I cover everything that's going on every day. They're good if you, if you work out like me. No, uh, if you, uh, but you know, whatever, walking to work, driving to work. And, and then we also, in fact, at 2 o'clock today, me and Damon are doing up here, I think, with uh, Luke and uh, James and we're, we're going to play hit them the hardball questions, you know, so none of this fluff stuff, right, you know, so um, going on, and we're on iTunes, and then I am Bachikaloop on Twitter, 
right? So if you could spell it, I'll send you a coffee cup. Um, uh, John at DTL Solutions, DevTops.blog, we're pretty much out there. We love DevOps. We'd love to help you. I love to talk to people. Tell me your story. I'll talk about it in DevOps drops because I just love this stuff. Thank you. Cool. Any questions while uh, we got the uh, next speakers coming up? All right, Nana. All right, well, so, thanks again. Oh. Hey, uh, if you want, if you have any questions, anything that you've always wanted to ask the uh, senior management at, at uh, Puppet Labs, um, we're going to be asking today on stage at two. So uh, find John or I between now and then, and uh, give us any uh, any qu any extra questions or ideas. It could be something you always want to know, something you're always curious about, anything to do with uh, with Puppet or DevOps or operations in general. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks, guys.